Hello everyone, thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar, IoT Made Simple, Real-Time Device Control, Monitoring and Data Analysis. My name is Grace and I'm the Marketing Manager at PubNub, and I'm joined today by Bhavna Srinivas, Solutions Architect at PubNub. We'll also be joined by Craig Conover, Customer Support Manager. Actually, some of you might have heard some of his webinars in the past, but he'll be online answering questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to ask away on the questions panel. We do have a lot to review, but don't worry so much about taking notes because as a follow-up, we always send this presentation to you so you can go through it at your own pace. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. And as far as our agenda goes, I'll be giving a quick introduction to Pubna before Pubna dives into more details about IoT application pain points and use cases. And we'll end the last 15 minutes or so with a Q&A. Now to tell you a little bit more about Pubna. Since our inception about seven years ago, PubNub has established itself as the leading global data stream network, providing real-time infrastructure as a service. Currently, we have about 150,000 developers and 2,000 plus customers all around the world. PubNub's value derives from a highly reliable, always-on secure network that delivers quarter-second latency with end-to-end -end encryption. At the end of the day, though, PubNub is built by developers for developers. We understand how painful and costly it is to build out a robust backend infrastructure. So with that in mind, we'll build and scale your infrastructure so you can just focus on building great products and get to market faster. As a developer, it doesn't matter what environment you're building on. We maintain over 70 SDKs to support your application. The core of PubNub's real-time infrastructure is built on PubSub. But in addition to that, we offer a number of robust real-time features, including mobile push and storage and playback and so forth. All of these features are reinforced by high levels of security and also an analytics dashboard for monitoring. There are so many different use cases for PubNub's data stream network, but its most common use cases are chat, IoT, and real-time updates for like geolocation and tracking, for example. Today though, we're going to just focus on IoT device control and how real-time infrastructure like PubNub is vital to building scalable IoT applications. To kind of give you a scope and scale of where PubNub is today, we have around 330 million monthly devices connected to the PubNub network, sending over 2 trillion transactions with, within a quarter second. We're able to do this because we have around 15 points of presence all around the world, providing a 5 nines SLA for our customers. Today, over 2,000 customers trust PubNub. We sit across 35 different industry verticals all around the world, from two-person startups to Fortune 500 companies. And this slide just highlights some of our top use cases and customers. You can just see some of the variety of them in the slide alone. Now that I've given you a quick intro to PubNub, I want to go ahead and pass the mic over to Bhavna. We'll talk to you more about how real-time infrastructures like PubNub is vital to building scalable IoT apps. Hi everybody, this is Bhavna speaking and I'm excited to be talking about building an IoT application. Thank you for joining uh, all of us on this fine Wednesday morning. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my role. I work as a solutions architect. I am talking to customers uh, every day, customers and prospects, suggesting design patterns and best practices on how to actually build applications over PubNub. So today we're um, going to be focusing on how to build an IoT application and the pain points that are uh, involved with that. So I worked on a couple of IoT applications myself in the past and from experience I feel like an IoT app can be broken down into three parts. So I want to walk us through these different components and so um, let's go from top to bottom. So broadly speaking we have the things anything from cars to the locks, doors, refrigerators, thermostats, and anything that actually senses the environment or observes any changes. So these are the edge devices. They have little or no memory, power or bandwidth constraints, and uh, use one of the many protocols to communicate with probably a more powerful hub. So then we have the software or the infrastructure itself that's used to send and receive data between these things um, and maybe a server or a database for data collection and processing. So there's some analytics that happens 
uh, usually in this layer to make that data more enticing to end users. So the last broad component, uh, in my opinion, are the end user devices. So mobile applications and dashboards that users use to actually consume the data sent from these sensors in any form that's useful to them. So the important thing to notice or observe is that, you know, this data flows in both ways to and from the things of the end user devices. So you want to consume the information, you probably want to transform it, aggregate it, make sense of it, and also control the devices based on the data received. So for instance, you want to control the thermostat based on the values it sends you. Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Like adjust it accordingly. Um, so from that previous image, you can see that there's a lot to take into consideration while building an IoT app, starting from the things in the Internet of Things, the network itself or the infrastructure that will support them, and the mobile devices that consume that data. So I'm going to walk through all of these pain points that I have faced while building an IoT application, but also maintaining a strong focus on the real-time components of it. So um, let's start off with the, the things themselves. Um, yeah, so there's so many of them, right? So these days you could be connecting anything from your phones to your garage doors, to the locks, to uh, refrigerators. So these are all different MCUs or MPUs and all running, you know, different iOSs, basically very, very different platforms. So you want all of these different devices to be able to talk to each other, maybe using a protocol that all of them understand, uh, understand very well, so that you don't have to worry about that at a later point. Um, and then we have these power drain and bandwidth considerations because most of these devices have these kind of power constraints. They have mem they have uh, uh, pretty low they're pretty low on memory. They can't be online all the time. And so this is also something uh, that affects the pro like it it affects your decision while choosing a communication protocol. You want something that reduces uh, the chattiness to keep power drain uh, to a minimum while also taking into consideration the bandwidth requirements of that device. And the next one that we're going to focus on is bidirectional data flow. Even from that first image, that was what I was trying to get to. It's no longer, we're no longer at that point where, um, um, it's no longer at that point where we're just collecting data from all of the devices. We want to be able to send and receive data um, between all of them at the same time. So you want to monitor the devices based on what they send. You want to control them. There's data flowing from the devices to the dashboards to the back end. So um, there's um, a, a lot of uh, things to be considering and data flow between all of these devices. So for instance, take uh, wash lava. Um, I, I don't know if a lot of you have heard of this. My mind was blown when I, when I did hear about it. It's the first app-enabled laundromat. So gone are those days of using um, quarters to do your laundry. So basically it allows customers to reserve and pay for machines from their smartphones. So you can monitor, track, and control the entire cycle of your laundry remotely. And so they have dashboards. Manager has full control over all the finances, the analytics themselves. And uh, you as a user, your, your job is made so much more simpler because you're all controlling it from a phone. So the devices that we're talking about in this use case, they're, they're not conventional at all. We have laundry machines, we have the phones and the dashboards. So for them, it was important that all of these devices talk to each other, to and from all of them to, uh, to the others. So they decided to use PubNub and what they use us is for that real-time communication between the laundry machines and the backend system. So they had these embedded systems within each of these machines. They were kept online through Wi-Fi they were allowing the bi-directional communication between the machines and the wash lava backend. And uh, so the way it worked was the backend issues a command to the machine via PubNub. And then this is also reflected on the business dashboard and the customer's app. So you can see how um, there's data flowing between all of these different devices. And so the feature that they used was what we call real-time messaging. And it's just built over a PubSub paradigm, messaging paradigm. So we abstract the complexity associated with PubNub, like opening sockets, the TCP handshake, et cetera. And we just provide very easy to use APIs to send and receive data between the devices. So, um, so what does this achieve? Like, so you can probably, you want to, you know, have a one-to-one -one communication between your phone and the device itself, or you want to uh, be able to broadcast a message 
to a bunch of sensors that you've deployed in the field, like you know something that says, "Hey, there's a firmware upgrade. All of you do um, have to upgrade your firmware." And this is a machine. This is a message that you probably have to send from one central computer to a lot of devices. So whether it's one to one or one to many, uh, PubNub uh, PubSub will support that. And um, also, it was built uh, keeping in mind unreliable connectivity. So you know, with IoT devices, you can never guarantee that the devices are connected to the internet all the time, or they might always be in unreliable networks, right? So um, we have a catch-up feature that can handle this kind of unreliable connections because we cache those messages that come in, and then we re-deliver them based on when the devices reconnect. And also, you can send out push notifications if you have a mobile app associated with your IoT application using our PubSub messaging. Um, so Grace must uh, Grace touched upon this, but uh, this is just to reinforce that we do support a lot of different platforms around 70 plus, and so the engineering team uh, uh, a lot of their time goes into maintaining all of these different ones from iOS to Android but a lot of embedded uh, platforms as well. So Arduino, Ras Raspberry Pi, all um, microchip, um, Atmel devices. So all of these different chipsets we're able to support. And um, these SDKs, they just abstract the complexity of the protocols, as well as you know it accounts for network connectivity and failover. Um, so you can just choose one of the different SDKs that you want and get going with the application. Um, so we we spoke about a couple of the pain points. Let's move on to some others that I faced, like presence detection and storing messages. Um, let's see. So yeah, so a common use case for IoT applications is to determine if a device is online or offline, or if there are any custom state changes. Like for instance, is my garage door locked or open? Are the access points active? How many users are on my network, etc. And so if there are changes, that needs to be communicated instantly. So maybe a bunch of sensors are down and you have to schedule maintenance for them. So how do you know about all this information? This is what I classify as device and user presence. And uh, the other pain point is message storage and retrieval. So sometimes devices go offline and they could be in, because they could, they are probably in spotty network conditions. So there's a need for the device to automatically try to reconnect and come back online as soon as possible. So when it does, it needs to access all the information that might have come in when it was offline. And uh, sometimes devices, like I mentioned, are also power constraints. So they probably go to sleep every now and then. Um, so messages that come in while they're asleep also need to be received by those devices. So basically, something that you have to consider is um, a storage uh, platform, right? So something that will store and retrieve all your messages um, when your devices are offline. So take, for instance, um, um, August Locks and Logitech. Um, August Lock is basically, it lets you um, lock and unlock your door. It creates virtual keys for guests and see, so that you can see and speak with the guests all remotely. So basically, you're able to control the locks in your house with a mobile application. So this is one of the applications where you can see how presence is so important, right? You want to know if uh, somebody's entered your house or someone's left the door unlocked. And uh, the same with any kind of home automation uh, app. Like, for instance, what Logitech has, it's the, it's the Harmony Ultimate Home Hub. So basically, you can control all the devices in your house with either a phone or a remote control. And you're able to check the status of those devices, uh, what, what's on, what's off, what status are they on. And so these guys use PubNub for this kind of presence information. So what we did was we started off with um, real-time messaging, right? Just PubSub. And then we realized that there was a need for this kind of presence monitoring, who is online when. And so we started providing APIs for that as well. Um, so you know, you want to check saying, hey, who's online at this point, at this instant? Or um, which channels are they online on? Or if a state changed, then I want to know about it. So we have APIs for all of these so that you don't have to go and build it. So for instance, say there's a thermostat in a freezer and it goes offline, Pavna will immediately send that message to you so you can now probably go check what the issue is or if there's some maintenance that you need to do. Um, the next thing that we discussed was message storage. So like I said, there are these use cases where probably devices go offline and you want to be able to store all those messages because um, 
people are not going to people or devices are not going to stop just because your device went offline there's still messages that are going to be sent all, all the time and so uh, the other the other use case is maybe you want to do a firmware upgrade so you know if there's a dev iot device that's ready for a firmware upgrade so but it's offline so or it's sleeping so on boot you can you can have it check the history of that firmware channel check what version it's on if there's a new version and probably pull those messages from history um, so what we do is every message that goes through PubNub is stored and it can be retrieved via the history API. So the point is that every single feature is um, provided as an API so that it's easy for developers to integrate it within their application. Um, yeah, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is security, though it's one of the most important uh, pain points in my um, uh, in my opinion. So a lot of people earlier, what they did was uh, because security was so difficult to work with or uh, they, they didn't have the time to do that, they, they brought their, mark, their product to market quickly and they kept security as an afterthought. And uh, sometimes, you know, the devices are so small that it's pretty impossible to even um, make it secure by finding the right model for it. So how do you go about like managing the username and password for all the connected devices or the appliances that you have at home and the privacy of your information? And uh, we've all heard about cases where, you know, baby monitors or video cameras are hacked into and uh, people are able to access all that information. So we don't want something like that to happen. Um, so take Snoo, for instance. Uh, there's this smart sleeper called Snoo, and uh, it's, uh, it's like a, a very effective baby bed. So um, security was very important to them, as you can imagine. You're putting your baby into this um, snoo um, sleeper, and uh, you're rocking your baby to sleep. So what it does is it soothes the infant crying, and uh, it, it you can like control that sleeper, and you can send rhythmic sensations to it so that uh, you can put your baby to sleep faster. So with the you use a mobile app, and you can change the soothing level. You can adjust its settings. And all this can be done remotely. You don't have to be right there. And so the, this team, they use PubNub as well. They were first, um, they had a homegrown solution where they were using REST API between these devices. But uh, it didn't scale too well. And they had unreliable communication using that. And so um, they wanted something secure, but which was also real time. And so um, this is another classic case where the devices are so different, right? So you have your mobile phone, but you also have this other, uh, a baby monitor, which uses a particular, probably a very custom MCU. And so um, we're able to work with them and provide them this kind of secure communication for them. So what we do is um, we're able to use AES and TLS uh, encryption with for all the messages. So starting from uh, your mobile phone till the baby monitor, end-to-end -end encryption of all the messages. And uh, with PubNub Access Manager, we, uh, we give you the ability to grant and revoke permissions for users. So if you feel like someone's using your application, someone has some kind of malicious intent, then you can just block that user or revoke their permissions. So they will no longer be able to send or receive messages um, to your devices. And uh, so we take extra steps. We have some regulatory standards that we comply with. We can provide like uh, EU or US only storage options. We provide um, uh, security if you were storing medical information, et cetera. So um, security definitely has to be a forethought more than anything else. Um, so uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, analyzing the, the data. So you know, gone are those days where we just collect the data and we act at it at a later point. That's stale data, and maybe there are some use cases for that, but uh, I'm again talking about the real-time component of an IoT application. So some, uh, some applications require real-time analysis of the data flowing between the devices. So one thing to consider while choosing the infrastructure is probably a programmable network, you know, one that allows you to work with that data instantly. Maybe you want to filter it, maybe you want to route it, maybe you want to process it in some way or the other before it reaches the destination. So, you know, for example, you want to, um, you want to deliver a message of a sent, like you want to deliver sensor readings to the end user only if it is over X degrees or below a certain, you know, value. So with uh, traditional architectures, this would require this, that the streams are offloaded you send it to your own servers, you send it to your own backend, you process them, and then you put them back on the network for delivery. 
So this removes that real-time aspect that we're talking about, right? So, and then you have all these servers that you have to maintain yourselves. Or maybe you want to integrate it with a third-party system, you know? So they want to store all the data. You want to store all the data going between your sensors, your mobile applications to a backend system. So you want to do that on the fly, asynchronously, as the data flows between your devices. So there's a lot of things that you can do with the data. There are a lot of applications that have this need. So that's one thing to consider when you think of an infrastructure or a platform to support your IoT application. So um, take, for instance, this uh, other company called IntelEscape.io. It's a development platform for something called IOR, which is Internet of Recognition. So they came up with this word. Um, basically, it they, 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 they bring about solutions that allow for like precision, like facial voice and vehicle recognition. And all this is for analytical purposes. So they're able to detect, you know, different things in the environment and do thing, do something about it. So what they said was they wanted to build on, I mean, they wanted to focus on building their IOR platform. They didn't want to maintain that real time infrastructure that powers the application. And they needed low latency server to server communication. They needed to analyze that data midstream, right? Before it reaches the destination. And also they were providing these uh, pretty dashboards for their customers with all kinds of charts and real time information and videos. And so this data that they were collecting needed to be routed to a third party service for, I think in their case, it was Microsoft's Power BI. So there's a, these are all like, I mean, different applications and each one you can see has a different need. They're not just sending data between devices, but they're probably saving it somewhere. They're doing something with it. They're sending it to another system and all this still needs to be in real time. And I'm pretty sure the um, expecting parents in this webinar remember SNU. Um, so they had a use case for uh, this kind of data analysis as well, wherein, you know, based on something that happens, they needed to send out a push notification. So maybe the baby's crying, maybe this volume is too low, maybe it's, um, the, you know, it's not, uh, the, I don't know, you need to put your baby to sleep and the baby's not asleep within a certain time frame. So these are all events that they cared about and wanted to be notified about. So um, based on certain user states and device events, you want to send out certain messages. So if you think about this, these are all like, um, real-time enhancements to your application. So you're doing something smart with that data that comes in. So um, something else to consider. So what we did is till now we were providing this infrastructure to build a real-time app over. Now we decided to make the network itself way smarter. So we gave, um, we're giving developers the ability to create and execute business logic on the messages that are flowing between your devices. So that now you can you know, build and deploy these microservices and kind of incorporate logic like routing, transforming that data, augmenting it, filtering it, and aggregating it. So you can do all of this on the network itself. So it's moved from being just a network which is sending data between devices to be able to do something more intelligent with it. So because we will do all of that, there's no need for you to worry about deploying it, maintaining it, or scaling your server infrastructure. Um, so the way this works is, I think it's, it's better explained by a diagram. So you can see how there's all of these devices, it could be your server, your backend, or you could be all of these IoT devices. They are at the edge of the network. They're publishing and subscribing via PubNub. And um, you put in this function of the business logic on PubNub. And um, so every time message hits this function, it triggers that function, it's executed. And so this can be anything like, filtering that data, so maybe, or, or aggregating it, or transforming it, and then sending it out in real time to the end users. So that's how a function works. In simple, I mean, you, you all might have come across this in some form or the other. You all might have implemented this on your own backend. We're now just giving you a way to do this on PubNub itself. And so these are some examples. So like, for instance, you know, you have all these uh, thermostats in refrigerators all over the world. You don't care as long as the temperature is within a certain range. But if it goes above or below a certain value, then you want to send out alerts and triggers to everybody else or to the stakeholders. So that's an example of what a function can do for you. Or some other use cases are um, you want to do some kind of sentiment analysis 
or you want to do things based on you know whether users are coming online or offline so your this device just went offline oh then let me trigger some kind of notification to send out or an alert so these are some of the use cases that you can uh, build with the function itself and um, so we discussed most of these pain points some others when it comes to businesses is that uh, you know your time to market itself like you want to focus on building your iot application but um, you don't have the time or the resources or um, you don't have the need to to worry about the infrastructure that powers it like um, you don't want to reinvent the wheel and so you have to take that into mind when choosing an infrastructure and the other thing is device provisioning like making your iot device plug and play so through home and business firewalls that's something that you need to consider as well um, so that brings me to the end of the webinar. So um, I only went through some of the issues, definitely didn't go through all of them. This is based on my experience of building an IoT application. So you are probably facing some other very interesting challenges. So if you or your company is building the next big IoT application, I would love to hear more about it. So like I said, I'm a solutions architect, so that's what I do. Um, these kind of things excite me and I, I'd like to figure out the best way to build that if possible. Um, so to summarize, in my opinion, like scalability is a very important factor. Like one thing that happens is uh, when you're building out a POC, um, you start with a couple of devices within uh, an office or a home network. So it's very steady internet connectivity, very few devices. But the minute you try to expand on that, like you know, move to thousands of devices and move to networks that are unreliable, that's when the problem arises. So make sure to choose a platform or a protocol or uh, that can handle millions of devices. Um, the other thing to consider is, the, is uh, that you should be able to support a lot of devices. Like today you might have device types A, B, and C, but tomorrow you're adding X, Y, and Z. So you make sure that you're choosing a communication protocol that works with all of these uh, devices. And uh, the last but not the least, security should never be an afterthought. Um, it's more of a forethought. It has to be baked into the application from the beginning. And uh, also, like we talked about all these um, you know, different things you can do with the data these days, more than just collecting it. So you want to be able to process that data at the edge. So combining this kind of processing with the real-time connectivity is very important and it's a very powerful consideration. Um, so yeah, so we come to the end of it. Um, if you have any questions, I can see that Craig's been answering a lot of questions. Um, if you have any questions, we'd love to talk about it. If you feel like you want to reach out to me personally, then about your company's IoT application, happy to engage even that way that my email address is on the slide here. Um, so let me just go ahead and check if there's any questions that are coming in. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, can you please talk about the new feature functions acting as an endpoint? Thank you for bringing that up. I uh, didn't actually talk about that in too much detail. So first of all, I want to say that we have a webinar on functions itself. So um, it's live on YouTube right now. Yeah, so um, we can send that to you, but that said... Um, and on our website too. Yeah, it's on the website as well. So that said, so the functions itself can be triggered in many ways. So maybe you know your um, you want to uh, send information and uh, trigger the function based on the message that you send. But extra, we decided that you don't even have to be within the PubNub ecosystem to be able to trigger a function. So we've now wrapped. You can wrap any function with a URL and treat it like any other endpoint. So you can hit it from any external source. So maybe you have your own application going, you're sending data via the function, or you're using the function that's connected to an IBM kind of service to do uh, sentiment analysis. So the function acts as an endpoint. And uh, the benefit of that is that the function is as reliable and highly available as the PubNub network. So as your application scales, the PubNub function will scale with you. So you could be using any communication protocol or anything else for your own application, but you just treat uh, the function endpoint functions as an endpoint to hit from your application. You can just use like any of the uh, the REST APIs to do that. And so, for more detail, definitely go check out that uh, webinar um, on functions.
Um, so the other question that came in is, uh, do you support any kind of device? Yes, definitely. Um, we, like I said, we have 70 plus SDK, so some version of an SDK will support your device. But that said, we also customize the SDK to fit your device based on you know the, the memory and the power constraints and all of the different constraints that you might have. Um, we definitely can customize it for you. Um, and um, any question? How, how to use a function? OK. Um, that's so let's see um, how would I talk about where do I even begin how to use a function uh, yeah I don't know where to begin yeah so, so so much here that's a whole nother webinar but uh, exactly so basically uh, you if you understood the use cases for a function like you know so adding some kind of real-time enhancements to your application so with the IOT application what I was talking about if you have refrigerators you set some kind of threshold. So data hits your, so from your device, data hits the function. It executes the function which says, oh, okay, um, it's, is the value above or below a certain uh, threshold? If yes, do something. If not, do something. So basically what's happening is you are putting some amount of business logic on PubNub, and uh, this is triggered every time a message uh, hits it. So the way it can be triggered is several. So maybe you want to do it synchronously. Like, you know, every single message has to hit the function before going to the end destination. Or it could be done asynchronously wherein you're, you know, maybe messages are going between your end devices. And at the same time, you want to be able to send the message to your back end as well. So this can be an asynchronous or a non-blocking um, kind of function. So there's several ways to use a function, but, um, Definitely reach out to Craig at pubnub.com or bhavnatpubnub.com and we can maybe get on a call to discuss how exactly to do that. Um, there's a question there. There was a mention of token-based security in the slides. Yes. Um, okay. So, yeah, what we provide is a PubNub Access Manager, which um, lets you, gives you like, the authority to grant or revoke permissions per user or per channel or on a key level. So for instance, you can say, hey, I'm going to give permissions for A, B, and C for the next five hours on channels X, Y, and Z. That is what we refer to as token-based control or, or, or um, authorization. So we don't do authentication. We do authorization. So once you've authenticated a user and you say that, okay, user A is who user A claims to be, PubNub will now authorize that user using PubNub Access Manager. I hope that answered your question. Let me check. Um, no, okay. The functions can work like a pipeline, function, function, function. Definitely, so it depends on your use case. You can go from, like maybe, uh, you know, your data hits a function, that triggers another function based on the logic that you put, which triggers another function. So that's definitely possible, but you can also do all of that in one function itself. So you can put as much code in one function as possible. And the thing that I want to mention is that we, uh, you can write functions in JavaScript. We're working on other languages, but so for now it's only in JavaScript. Um, let's see. How can... No. Starts here. All right. Um, what authorization standard does your solution adhere to? And is that OAuth based? Um, let me jump in on this one real quick. I think I understand. So, so Robert, basically, um, let me just make sure everybody understands that there's two things here. We have authentication and authorization. We don't do authentication. You authenticate your users. Once they're authenticated, then you need to authorize them to do things in PubNub. You need to authorize them to read or write on different channels. And you would do that by granting the, those permissions uh, to an auth key using our access manager add-on. And it's not really OAuth based. I mean, you can have an auth system that feeds into that, but we don't integrate directly with it. But uh, it's definitely possible to do probably what you're asking. I think we need more specifics. I would recommend sending your specific details, uh, requirements, questions to support of Yeah. Um, and then how can we access, how can we access archive data? 
So yeah, once you, if you choose our storage um, feature, wherein you know, every message going through PubNub can be stored, and that's for uh, how much of a time that you want to. Maybe it's for a day, maybe it's for 30 days, maybe it's unlimited. So then we provide this history API. So now the history API, um, you can select saying, hey, on channel XYZ, give me the last five messages or give me all the messages, and we will pull that data out for you. So basically, the way to access the archive data is through the history API. And um, let's see. Yeah, take that one. yeah. Uh, what protocol is used, MQTT or HTTP? Um, so we PubNav is based off of um, HTTP long polling. And that said, we abstract all of the protocol level confusion that occurs and provide these APIs for you to use. So. All you're doing is saying, hey, using the publish API and you're sending out a message, PubNub will take care of delivering that in real time to the end user. We don't want you to be worrying about the kind of protocol that we support because we call ourselves protocol agnostic. Um, so the whole point of using our SDKs is that it abstracts the lower level complexity of a protocol. That said, to answer your question, it's HTTP long polling. Um, what if in an internet connection to PubNub network and local, can you click on the last one, Craig, sorry. Hmm. Is lost for a meaningful period of time. Is it, can we, does it able to restore connectivity when internet connection is restored and work at normal operation automatically without additional server client device actions? Yeah, so that's one of the um, uh, advantages of using our SDKs. So with most of our SDK, like the version four SDKs, we try to provide for automatic reconnection. So we have some reconnection policies. So once you choose that saying that, hey, uh, I want to be able to reconnect linearly or exponentially based on the SDK, we have some policies. But once you do that, the SD, once internet connectivity is back on, it automatically tries to connect that person back to the PubNub network. So the SDK will handle that for you. Um, if it's for a short period of time, say a minute or so, and if your message volume is low, then we cache those messages and you will receive them. But if it's for a longer period of time, say more than a couple of minutes, um, then you can use that history API that I was talking about. So the flow would be like your device lost connectivity, lost connectivity to PubNub, comes back online, connects to PubNub. You call the history API on the channel, you receive all those messages that you think you might have lost, and then you now actively subscribe to PubNub to receive the current messages coming in. Um, let's see. Um, bu -bu -bu. Yeah, do we get the slide shared? Definitely, we're going to be sending this to you. Um, we answered that one. Trying to answer this. I think it's 10 seconds. Yeah, I want to say 10. Uh, will long running delay subsequent execution of the same function or a function on the same channel? Um, I would rather take this offline and respond to you instead of giving you the wrong answer. So, um, Joel, we will get back to you on that question. Oh, yeah, can you just send us a support ticket? Craig will be happy to answer your question. <laughs> um, Last webinar slides not shared yet. Oh, that's a question for you, Grace. Is that a question, um, Satya Narayana? Um, it should be out, but uh, don't worry. We'll definitely send this. And we're recording this as well, so it will be on our platform soon. Yeah, so uh, within 24 hours, you'll get a e follow-up email from me directly with a link to uh, this recorded webinar. Okay, um, how to manage the storage on device as it will save history. Oh, so, okay, so when I say PubNub storage, it stores it on PubNub. It's not storing it on the device. The whole point is that PubNub will store those messages and the device just pulls it out when it requires, requires it. So it's not being saved on the device. Any tutorials or video online? Yeah, so if you go on pubnub.com forward slash blog or developers, we have a bunch of um, IOT applications. I mean, if you're interested in IOT, but then we support a lot of different other kind of use cases as well. So we have blogs and a lot of demos that can set you on the right path. And you can always contact us if you have a more, um, uh, a, a bigger question that you don't find an answer to. Yeah, and don't forget, guys, that PubNub offers a free tier. So whether you want to try out, you know, 
building a small hobby app or POC for your company, both fun PubNub functions and PubNub, um, all of our features are available for you to trial up to 100 devices, 1, mil 1 million messages. So I strongly recommend for you guys to just play around with it. That's the best way to learn how easy it is to set it up. Million messages per month, that is, plus free support. So You get to talk, chat with Craig all the time now. I'm really lonely. <laughs> Please send me questions. <laughs> Are you suggesting something like AWS Lambda service for the applications? Do you charge per thousand invo invocations or something like that? So yeah, the functions that I was talking about is pretty similar to AWS Lambda. It's an environment to run your business logic. But that said, both of them support very different kinds of use cases. This is more of in-stream data processing that needs to be very real time. Um, you might have heard some of the examples that I mentioned, like what you can do with a function. Um, but that said, Yes, we count the number of times it's triggered and executed. So each pricing tier comes with a bundle of functions, executions that you get with it. So um, more on our pricing page that we will send out a link to as well. Um, is there any support for UDP? Hubnub is uh, purely TCP based. Um, we do not support UDP. Um, all right, is it possible to use our own libraries in the function code? So we're working on that. Um, so far, we have a limited list of libraries that you can pull out uh, through NPM, but um, that's going to be updated as well. Oh, is there a heartbeat feature in PubNub? Yes, um, we do have a heartbeat feature, which basically is a ping from the device every now and then, and it's part of our presence feature offering. So definitely, we have, an, um, we have that feature. Are there function ex executions? Yes, right. definitely. Free function execution. Oh, are there free function executions? Within our free tier. Yeah, so within the free tier, it's free. <laughs> Duh. Uh, but uh, no, after that, once you start paying, like I mentioned, you get a bundle of function executions per tier that you pay for. Uh, but if you just want to try it out, um, definitely go on to our free tier, up to 100 devices and a million messages. You can use functions for free as well. We, oh, um, yeah, so I guess um, it's coming down to the end for us, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you, Craig. Um, if you guys have any more specific questions for your company's use case, um, feel free to reach out to either Bhavna or I. Uh, we're always available. And also to Craig at support at pubnub.com. Again, here's a link for you to get started with PubNub for free. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it looks like a lot of questions are coming in as well. So, yeah, just reach out to us and uh, we'll try to get back to you with the right answers. Also, happy to talk to your company if you have um, an IoT use case in mind. So, thank you for listening. Yeah. And thank you, everyone. Bye.